Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. One night in 1963, a couple were walking home down Swain's Lane, which passed along a cemetery's north gate. What they encountered was so terrible they were frozen to the spot, transfixed with fear. They had come face to face with what would later become known as the Highgate Vampire, a tall, dark figure floating behind the railings. Its face was the worst thing, a ghoulish nightmare contorted in horror. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… He was alone at home when firemen were called. The entire house was blazing, except for one room, the room that contained the corpse of J. Temple Thurston. A ghostly spirit brings comfort to a dying man's grandchild. Death comes to us all, but today children are shielded from the reality of death, only the stylized version they see in television and film. But years ago, when there was a death, it was a family affair. Everyone of all ages participated in the funeral and grieving process, and some people coped with their grief by being artistic, such as writing a weird song called the Hearse Song. We all know people who love nature and the outdoors. Some will even have their own gardens and will talk to the flowers and plants, thinking it'll help them to thrive. But how would you react when you are sure the plants are talking back to you? Mitchell Kai watched while the police looked for his missing wife. He even joined the search himself. No one ever expected that Mitchell was the one who had killed her. In 1986, the Tallmans moved into what they thought was the ideal family home. They couldn't have been more wrong. A weirdo family member shares how he has been stalked by a terrifying entity for many years. Not even serial killer Dennis Nielsen himself can say exactly how many people he murdered. There were just too many. How is it possible for a man as powerful and prominent as a Supreme Court judge to disappear forever? It happened to the Big Apple's Justice Joseph F. Crater. And did a vampire stalk London's Highgate Cemetery in the 1970s? We begin with the Highgate Vampire. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. In the early 1970s, a wave of panic spread around the North London suburb of Highgate. There was a vampire on the loose. Tales of the sinister, ghostly figure and bizarre occult rituals at the famous local cemetery had led many residents to fear for their safety. Although Highgate Cemetery had long been a hotspot for ghost sightings, the local and national media would soon come to seize on this particular apparition. The first sightings of the figure came in the early 1960s. Highgate Cemetery was by then over 100 years old and had fallen into disrepair and decay. Overgrown and sprawling, the Gothic Victorian graveyard seemed the perfect setting for the strange and sinister events that would follow. 
One night in 1963, a couple were walking home down Swain's Lane, which passed along Cemetery's north gate. What they encountered was so terrible they were frozen to the spot, transfixed with fear. They had come face to face with what would later be known as the Highgate Vampire, a tall, dark figure floating behind the railings. Its face was the worst thing, a ghoulish nightmare contorted in horror. And more sightings would follow. A man walking his dog saw the same tall, dark figure sliding over the wall along Swain's Lane, like black treacle, he said. By 1969, the reports from Highgate would pique the interest of David Ferrant, a young Wicca enthusiast and member of the British Occult Society. Ferrant, along with Bishop Sean Manchester, would become the two figures most associated with the case. The pair's antics over the next few years are now infamous, and the ensuing feud sparked between them lasts to this day. David Ferrant had first heard about the sightings in the late 60s and decided to investigate for himself. One winter's night, in December 1969, Ferrant camped out in the graveyard. He immediately hit ghostly pay dirt. Ferrant witnessed a very tall, dark figure with piercing, hypnotic eyes. The air around him had suddenly turned icy cold. This seemed to be the same entity he had heard about. The local newspaper in Highgate, the Hampstead and Highgate Express, had become interested in the sightings. In particular, the reports of Satanists performing black magic and sacrificing animals at the cemetery. The publicity attracted the attention of Sean Manchester, an eccentric and flamboyant figure that claimed to be a bishop in an obscure church. Not only was he a bishop, according to Manchester, but he was also a vampire hunter. In an interview with the Hampstead and Highgate Express in February 1970, Manchester claimed the figure was a king vampire, an undead 15th-century Romanian nobleman who had practiced black magic in Wallachia, the home of Dracula himself. Traveling to England, he had somehow ended up buried in what would become Highgate. Manchester told the paper that the vampire had been revived by the activity of the Satanists that were said to operate at the cemetery. Here, then, was born the legend of the Highgate Vampire. In March 1970, Ferrant and Manchester would both be interviewed about the sightings by the ITV News on the fitting date of Friday the 13th. Manchester repeated his florid account of the King Vampire and, after goading Ferrant, said he would personally be leading a vampire hunt at Highgate that very night. A mob of people in scenes reminiscent of a Hammer horror film soon descended on the cemetery. Hundreds of people climbed over the gates and walls to witness the hunt. It turned out to be a bit of a damp squib. The hunt failed to find, least of all stake, a vampire. Several of those that took part did, however, report seeing a strange dark figure in the grounds of the cemetery. Ferrant and Manchester continued to investigate Highgate and its supposed vampire. Ferrant was even arrested later in 1970 near the cemetery, carrying a crucifix and a wooden stake. In the years that followed, the pair would publish numerous books about the affair and their rivalry would grow more bitter. In 1985, Manchester self-published his book, The Highgate Vampire. In it, he sensationally claimed to have hunted the vampire for a further 13 years before finally staking, beheading, and burning it. Manchester had consigned the ungodly being to hell. He even had the photos to prove it. Did a vampire really stalk Highgate Cemetery? Legends and myths of blood-drinking demons go back for millennia in nearly all cultures. Lilitu in Babylonia, a female demon who drank the blood of babies, Vitalius in India, and Empusa 
in ancient Greece, they all bore vampire-like qualities. The modern vampire mythos originated in Eastern Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. Jur Grando, a Croatian peasant, died in 1656 and became one of the first historical figures to be described as a vampire. Grando was said to have come back to life as a blood-sucking, undead corpse to terrorize the residents of his village. He was eventually put to rest after a plucky villager cut his head off, a stake through the heart having failed to stop his rampage. During the 18th century, a number of supposed vampire outbreaks caused widespread panic in Prussia and Serbia. Exhumations and stakings became common. News of this vampire hysteria filtered through to Germany and England and inspired some of the earliest vampire fiction, such as Heinrich August Ostenfelder's poem, The Vampire, and Elizabeth Caroline Gray's novel, The Skeleton Count or The Vampire Mistress. In 1897, Irish author Bram Stoker's Dracula was published and would become the definitive account of the modern vampire legend. Stoker's book established many of the common tropes we recognize today. His vampire had no reflection. He could change his shape into an animal. He spawned vampire brides and he would have an arch enemy, Van Helsing. Dracula would go on to inspire innumerable films, books, TV shows, and other media, and it seems the principal players in the Highgate vampire saga as well. Beyond fiction, many attempts have been made to find real-world explanations for vampires. In 1985, Canadian biochemist David Dolphin suggested a rare blood disease called porphyria may be the real source behind vampire legends. Porphyria sufferers lack a vital pigment in their blood, and Dolphin suggested the ingestion of blood in vampire lore may be an attempt to replace this. Furthermore, porphyria sufferers can be acutely sensitive to light, to the extent that their skin can blister and burn in sunlight. Spanish neurologist Juan Gomez Alonso had an alternative explanation. In 1998, he noted that the symptoms of vampirism bore a striking resemblance to rabies. Rabies sufferers can become hypersensitive to light, water, and strong odors such as garlic. The disease attacks the central nervous system, often leading to the victim becoming demented, nocturnal, and even hypersexual, all qualities associated with vampires. Rabies can also cause spasming that forces the victims to cough up blood. Rather than undead demons, could vampires simply be rabies sufferers? Gomez Alonso found another interesting coincidence to back up his theory. Many of the famous vampire panics of the 17th century in Eastern Europe coincided with rabies outbreaks. Other suggested medical causes for vampirism are pellagra, a chronic shortage of niacin that causes the victims to blister in sunlight, and tuberculosis, which causes pale skin and red, swollen eyes and lips. Perhaps the most compelling real-world explanation for vampirism isn't physical, though, but psychological. Blood drinking and other vampiric rituals are a feature of many psychopathic and serial murderers. Richard Trenton Chase was nicknamed the Vampire Killer because he drank his victims' blood and ate their remains. Fritz Harman, the Vampire of Hanover, murdered 24 boys in Germany in the years following World War I. His preferred killing method was biting into their necks and throats. Ninety-year-old Mabel Leishon was stabbed to death at her home in Anglesley, Wales in November 2001. Her killer, 17-year-old Matthew Hardman, cut out her heart and drank her blood from a saucepan. If the Highgate vampire really existed, could he be a psychopath who believed himself to be a vampire? Or as some suspected, were the psychopaths the ones doing the hunting. Whilst there were many sightings of ghostly apparitions in and around Highgate Cemetery dating back to its construction, most of them were decidedly unvampiric in nature. 
reports were diverse and inconsistent. A man in a hat, a white lady, a phantom cyclist, a paddling figure in a pond, a woman pushed over in the dark, and noises such as bells and voices. It wasn't until the two central characters in the story, David Ferrant and Sean Manchester, entered the fray that there was any suggestion of actual vampires. Between them, they have written numerous books about the affair and developed a bitter rivalry that continues into the age of the Internet. But perhaps the thing they have most in common is the complete lack of evidence they provide for their claims. There is, and remains, nothing beyond the theatrical antics of the two men to suggest there was ever any kind of vampire prowling the decaying tombs of Highgate. Today, Ferrant says he does not believe what he refers to as the entity was a vampire at all. In fact, he now states he never said it was in the first place. This would appear to make his 1970 arrest Ferrant was found by police lurking at an adjoining garden to Highgate with a crucifix and a wooden stake all the more puzzling. But it was Sean Manchester's book, The Highgate Vampire, recounting his incredible quest to hunt down and destroy the creature that would do most to cement the enduring legend in the minds of the public. However, after reading it, many would come to wonder why it was in the non-fiction section of the bookstores. Highgate Cemetery has long been featured in vampire lore. In Bram Stoker's Dracula, Lucy Westenra is buried at Highgate before rising as the undead to prey on local children. Just a year before the events of the Highgate Vampire, Hammer filmed the latest in their series of famous horror films, Taste the Blood of Dracula, and they filmed it in the Highgate Cemetery. By the 1960s, Highgate had fallen heavily into disrepair. The foliage was thick and overgrown. Tombs and coffins were broken, and even some human remains had become exposed. Replete with many strange and beautiful high Gothic monuments, it also featured the Egyptian Avenue with two large obelisks and the foreboding Circle of Lebanon, a ring of vaults and catacombs. It's therefore not a surprise that this heady atmosphere would attract both horror filmmakers and those involved in the occult revival of the late 60s and early 70s. It certainly seems that Satanists were operating out of Highgate at the time. Black magic symbols and ritual paraphernalia were found, and even grisly incidents of tomb desecrations were recorded. In 1971, the charred, headless body of a woman with a stake through her chest was found at the cemetery. It was clear some dangerous and disturbed people were letting their imaginations get the better of them. Indeed, many of the events of the Highgate Vampire story appeared to come straight from the pages of popular vampire fiction. The antics of Sean Manchester, recounted in lurid fashion in his books, read like a mishmash of late-night horror films and bad vampire novels. In his self-published 1985 work, Manchester claims that on the vampire hunt of 1970, his sleepwalking psychic companion, who just happened to be a beautiful young blonde girl, led him through the catacombs to the vampire's lair. Unable to break into the vault, Manchester says he had sealed in through a hole in the roof, unnoticed by the large number of police in the area. Finding only empty coffins, he placed garlic and holy water around them to ward the monster off from returning. Having apparently escaped his grasp, the vampire hunter then recounts his 13-year quest to hunt down and destroy the evil creature, eventually tracking it to an eerie, abandoned old house in London's Crouch End. Finding the vampire in its coffin like a real-life Van Helsing, Manchester says he kicked the lid off its casket, staked it through the heart, and burned the body, finally condemning the accursed creature to hell. If this wasn't enough, Manchester capped his tail with an audacious flourish. His undead sleepwalking companion, who he called Lucia, was now possessed by the evil vampire. Whilst trying to exorcise her, 
she turned into a giant spider, which Manchester wrestled with before driving a stake through its heart and releasing Lucia from the evil spell. Manchester then had moved far beyond the improbable into the utterly absurd. Several aspects of his story are obviously borrowed directly from fiction. The undead sleepwalking Lucia is a thinly veiled facsimile of Lucy from Stoker's Dracula. In several of the incidents Manchester recounts bear an uncanny resemblance to the work of author Dennis Wheatley. Like much of the story surrounding the Highgate vampire, Manchester's account was a classic example of what folklorists call ostention, essentially life imitating art. Ostention often revolves around places like Highgate, spooky and thick with legend and atmosphere. It is a location ripe for overactive imaginations to bring to life stories from the pages of fiction. If then much of the strange tale of the Highgate vampire was more hammer horror than genuine haunting, the film studio repaid the compliment two years later. Dracula, 1972 AD, according to author Bill Ellis, was directly inspired by news reports of the events at Highgate. A case of life imitating art imitating life. Coming up on Weird Darkness, a weirdo family member shares how he's been stalked by a terrifying entity for many years. Plus, how is it possible for a man as powerful and prominent as a Supreme Court judge to disappear forever? It happened to the Big Apple's Justice Joseph F. Crater. But first, not even serial killer Dennis Nielsen himself can say exactly how many people he murdered. There were just too many. That story is up next. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. No one, not even Dennis Nilsson himself, can say just how many people he killed between December of 1978 and his arrest in February of 1983. His crimes earned him a variety of nicknames. The British Jeffrey Dahmer, given the grisly nature of the murders. The Muswell Hill murderer for the North London neighborhood where he committed his deeds. And most chilling of all, the kindly killer, as Nielsen himself believed that his method of execution was humane. What we do know is that Nilsson killed anywhere from a dozen to sixteen men and kept their bodies in his home, sometimes for months at a time. Nilsson's victims were students and homeless men that he met and lured back to his place, sometimes for sex or merely companionship. Booze and food were often promised. At some point during the night, though, Nilsson would seize upon his victim strangling him and holding his head underwater until death. After each murder, Nilsson engaged in a series of rituals that began with bathing and clothing the victim's body. 
he often posed the corpses, sometimes in a sexually suggestive manner, other times as though they were cohabiting the apartment, with the corpse at rest in an armchair as Nilsson watched TV. Like Jeffrey Dahmer, Nilsson is said to have sought in each victim someone who wouldn't leave him. He kept the corpse of his first victim, 14-year-old Stephen Holmes, under his floorboards for nearly eight months. Then, using culinary skills he learned as a cook in the Army, Nilsson would dismember the bodies, often burning the remains in an outdoor fire pit in his garden. An admitted necrophiliac, Nilsson claimed to have masturbated while viewing the dead bodies of several of his victims and to have engaged in sex acts with at least six different corpses, though he was insistent that he never penetrated any of the bodies. Even before his murders, Nilsson's sexual fantasies revolved around partners who were dead or passive to the point of unconsciousness and sometimes drew inspiration from the painting The Raft of the Medusa by Theodore Jericho, in which an old man holds the nude, limp body of a younger man. Nilsson's arrest in February of 1983 was precipitated by his move to an upstairs flat in 1981. Without a spacious garden out back, he found it increasingly difficult to dispose of his corpses. Since he occupied an attic room, he could no longer conceal the bodies beneath the floorboards. So Nilsson attempted to dispose of some body parts by flushing them down the drain. The approach blocked up the building's sewer system, leading to complaints from tenants, including, oddly, Nilsson himself. Plumbers were called to clear the blockage. They soon discovered the pipes were packed with bone fragments and a fatty substance that looked like chicken. The source was traced to the top flat in the building. Police were alerted, and when they raided Dennis Nilsson's home, they found suitcases full of human organs and bags of human remains concealed in his rooms. Three human heads were also found in a cupboard. Nilsson apologized to the police for not being able to tell them the exact number of murders he had committed, yet he offered up remarkably detailed confessions as to what he did with the bodies. Among other things, he admitted to boiling the heads, hands, and feet of several of his victims. Nielsen was brought to trial in the fall of 1983. He was found guilty of his crimes and sentenced to life in prison. Currently, he resides in a maximum security prison in the East Riding of Yorkshire. After his incarceration, Nilsson wrote a 400-page autobiography entitled The History of a Drowning Boy, which remains unpublished. When asked about the murders, Nilsson once said, I caused dreams which caused death. This is my crime. Hello. This is a story I have to tell that either falls under paranormal or supernatural, though I don't see a distinguishment between the two words. I am a person who doesn't like to reveal my identity, and I'm sorry for that, so I'll just go by the name Benji for this story and all future stories I might submit. Now, this story isn't about some inanimate object moving on its own or some gateway to an alternate dimension. No, this story is about a creature who legitimately terrified me and stalked me for a few years of my life. To some, this story might be a bit cliché, but this entity actually scared me during a few encounters I've had with it. So I'll tell you about the four encounters I've had with this thing in the order that they happened. Some details are a little fuzzy in my memory, so I'm sorry if I can't give full details. The very first encounter with this entity that I had was in a small town named Tres Brazos, which resided in my home island of the Dominican Republic. Back then, me and my father were visiting some friends and family members, and we were both sleeping in a room. This whole thing was when I think I was about six years old. When I woke up in the room, I looked out through the window blinds, and I saw that it was approaching dusk and at that moment I remember hearing stray dogs howling and barking for what seemed like a minute before stopping. I decided to look at a corner of the room and stare at it to fall asleep. And that's when I saw it. 
in the corner of the room, where there was almost no light, was a pitch-black mass with horns protruding from its presumed head. At first, it just stood there, staring at me. After a few seconds, it lunged out of the darkness and revealed itself to be a six-horned goat with manic and crazed eyes. The creature bleated before it jumped onto the bed I was sleeping on and then it hit me in the chest several times with its hoof. And then I, I woke up instantly and it was daytime. At first I didn't think of it, but then I realized that not only was it a nightmare when this encounter took place, but I was already awake when the nightmare happened. I freaked out a little, but brushed it off as being my crazy imagination. The second encounter happened roughly a year later after the first. This one took place in an apartment in Charlotte that me and my parents were renting as a home. At that time, I was eight and I had various toys. One of them was a Garfield clock that I had on a television. The clock didn't work, but I kept it anyway because I liked it. And most of the toys I had were stuffed in this sock that was stretched out and was as long as a serpent. Anyway, back on topic it was nighttime once again, and this time I was on one wall of the room and the door to my room was wide open, but I was too scared to get up and close it. When I looked at the door for long enough, the figure from the first encounter rushed into the room and stopped at the foot of my bed. It was the same goat as before, only his hair was black, his back legs were deformed and mangled, and his breathing was noticeably deeper. This time he spoke in a deep male voice and it said something along the lines of, you shall be my sustenance, before hitting me again in the chest, causing me to wake up again at daytime despite me being previously awake and it being nighttime. I started to realize that this creature was stalking me and could sort of transport me into the future, causing me to start off waking up from bed even if I was already awake. Again, I brushed it off not aware that this could have been a supernatural entity I was facing. Then there came Encounter 3. This one took place in an apartment in New York. I was sleeping on the same bed as my grandmother. I was about nine when this encounter took place. I wanted to get up early as I noticed the sun was starting to rise. I slowly slid off the bed as to not wake her up. I slowly walked out of the room due to that floor being very creaky and once I got out of the room, I turned right and slowly made my way towards the kitchen. Mind you, the kitchen was cut into the wall like a sort of L shape. Just as I was seven feet from the kitchen, the goat darted from behind the kitchen corner, barreling towards me so fast I didn't even have time to scream. It appeared with light gray hair this time, and I didn't see its eyes. As soon as I was headbutted by the creature, I was teleported right back into the bedroom right next to my grandma. I made a second attempt to sneak to the kitchen, and this time I made it all the way with no sign of the goat anywhere. I couldn't shake the feeling that this would not be my last encounter, and sure enough, I was right. Now here in this story is the fourth and final encounter I had with the goat. This took place in the same apartment as the second encounter. I had had enough of this creature stalking me, so I told my parents about the goat. My dad appeared to jokingly say he was going to cut up and cook the creature if he saw it, which boosted my confidence, as it naturally does when a kid is reassured by his parents. It was then, during the afternoon the next day, when the beast appeared in front of the foot of my bed for the last time. Only now, its form was entirely different from the previous encounters, as now it took the form of a minotaur with an axe and a ring through its nose and it lost four of its horns in addition. The goat, now I should say Minotaur, let out a bellow before trying to attack me with the axe. However, not only was the creature now incredibly slow, its body appeared malnourished, and it could barely lift the axe, let alone swing it. At this point, I was stuck between dreaming and being awake, and at that point I was no longer afraid of the creature. I could get rid of it once and for all, for I might have never gotten that chance again. I stood up and kicked away the axe from the Minotaur's grasp. Then I summoned a katana with my dream powers and with a triumphant battle cry, 
hacked off its head with the blade. Even without its head, the Minotaur let out one final bellowing scream before its headless corpse fell to the ground, and its entire body, head and all the blood, disappeared forever. As soon as it vanished, I snapped out of my in-between state and was now fully awake. I was finally at peace. The creature was finally defeated. And after that, I have never seen that goat since. I'm now a young teen who is waiting to enter high school as a freshman. I still look back and remember the encounters I've had with that goat. I don't know what the thing was, but it wasn't just a goat. If I was facing some sort of terrifying demon, then I guess I should count myself the luckiest child to still be walking on this earth. Perhaps no disappearance in American history has created as much speculation as that of New York Supreme Court Associate Justice Joseph F. Crater. For many years, he was known simply as the most missingest man in New York. He was last seen on the evening of August 6, 1930, walking out of a New York restaurant. Crater was a tall, heavy-set man and an avowed clothes horse, he was especially dapper that evening as he stepped out of the restaurant, waved goodbye to a couple of friends, and then climbed into a taxicab. His friends would remember his double-breasted brown suit, gray spats, and a straw Panama hat over his smoothed-down iron-gray hair, for it was the last outfit they ever saw him wear. After that final glimpse, Crater was never seen again. But how is it possible for a man as powerful and prominent as a Supreme Court judge to disappear forever. Judge Crater's career was unquestionably successful. He was born and raised in Easton, Pennsylvania, and later graduated from Lafayette College and Columbia University Law School. In 1913, he began practicing law in New York and got involved in local politics. He soon became president of the Democratic Party Club in Manhattan and saw his law practice flourish thanks to his connections to the corrupt Democrat leadership at Tammany Hall. In April 1930, he was appointed to the New York Supreme Court. He had withdrawn $20,000 from the bank just days before his appointment. The sum was close to a year's salary, but that was the standard Tammany payoff for the lucrative post. It was not a poor investment either. According to investigators who later looked into his role as a receiver of a bankrupt hotel, Crater sold it to a bond and mortgage firm for $75,000, and two months later the city agreed to buy it back for a planned street widening at a condemned property price of almost $3 million. Crater did just as well in his private life. In 1916, a woman named Stella Wheeler retained him in a divorce trial and the next year, right after her divorce became final, Crater married her. By all accounts, they appeared to be a happy and devoted couple. In the summer of 1930, 41-year-old Crater and his wife were vacationing at their summer cabin in Belgrade Lakes, Maine. In late July, he received a telephone call and he offered no information to his wife about the content of the call, other than to say that he had to return to the city to straighten those fellows out. The following day, he arrived at his Fifth Avenue apartment. Instead of dealing with business, though, he made a trip to Atlantic City in the company of a showgirl. On August 3rd, he was back in New York, and on the morning of August 6th, he spent two hours going through his files in his courthouse chambers. He then had his assistant, Joseph Mara, cash two checks for him that amounted to $5,150. At noon, he and Mara carried two locked briefcases to his apartment, and he let Mara take the rest of the day off. Later that evening, Crater went to a Broadway ticket agency and purchased one seat for a comedy that was playing that night called Dancing Partners at the Belasco Theater. He then went to Billy Haas's Chop House at West 45th Street for dinner. There he ran into a couple of friends, a fellow attorney and his showgirl date, and he joined them for dinner. The lawyer later told investigators that Crater was in a good mood that evening and gave no indication that anything was bothering him. 
The dinner ended a little after 9 p.m., a short time after the curtain had opened for the show that Crater had a ticket for. The group went outside, and as Crater stepped into the taxi that he hailed down, he waved goodbye to his friends. His next, and likely final, destination remains a mystery. Strangely, there was no immediate reaction to Judge Crater's disappearance. When he did not return to Maine as scheduled on August 9th, Mrs. Crater grew concerned. Nevertheless, she waited six days before dispatching Kohler, the family driver, to New York to see if he could learn anything. When Kohler arrived at the Fifth Avenue apartment, the maid told him that Judge Crater's bed had not been slept in since August 8th. Kohler next began telephoning Crater's friends. They were all excessively reassuring about the welfare of the judge, believing that no harm could have come to him. All of his friends were acutely aware that any hint of a mysterious disappearance might hurt Crater's chance for re-election in November. They were anxious that any odd behavior on Crater's part be kept hidden from the voting public. In addition, they wanted to make sure his extramarital sex life was carefully hidden as well. Crater had always confined his interest to nightclub parties, one-night stands, and prostitutes, but suppose the middle-aged man had come across a young woman that he had fallen for and he had taken her off on an extended trip. If that was the case, his cronies were anxious to soft-pedal his disappearance. So Kohler returned to Maine on August 20th, relieved that no harm had come to the judge. He informed Mrs. Crater that her husband must surely be safe, though no one seemed to have any idea where he might be. He was sure that he would return on August 28th when he was scheduled to preside over the first session of the special term. But when Crater didn't make an appearance for this important session, word began to circulate that something was amiss. Stella Crater, her worst fears apparently justified, hurried to New York. She began calling her husband's friends, including Martin J. Healy, who was summering on Long Island. Healy later stated that Mrs. Crater became hysterical when he could not tell her anything. Healy, along with others, strongly advised her to return to Maine. Against her better judgment, she did. An unofficial search was started for Crater, led by a city detective named Leo Lowenthal, who often acted as a bodyguard for one of Crater's political friends. He visited the judge's chambers and learned of the two briefcases believed to be filled with personal papers that the judge and his assistant had carried out of the office. Lowenthal next went to the Fifth Avenue apartment but found no trace of the papers, nor any charred remains to indicate that they'd been burned. He noted with interest that Crater's vest was in his bedroom but found nothing else unusual. With no trace of the judge to be found, the police commissioner was finally notified of the disappearance on September 3rd. After that, the case of the missing judge became front-page news. The story captivated the nation and a massive investigation was launched. Had Crater been killed or had he simply disappeared on his own? Those were the questions that everyone wanted answers to, from police detectives to shady business partners to the average man on the street. The official investigations started off in a hurry but quickly slowed down. Detectives discovered that the judge's safe deposit box had been cleaned out and the two briefcases that Crater and Mara had taken to his apartment were missing. These promising leads were quickly bogged down by the thousands of false reports that were coming in from people who claimed to have seen the missing man. The district attorney centered his investigation on Mrs. Crater while the police began delving into his financial and sexual affairs. It was found that he had a safe deposit box at the Empire Trust Company, but it turned out to be empty. Detectives looking into Crater's love life were far more successful, and they found that for years Crater had been on friendly terms with Constance Bramer Marcus, a raven-haired woman in her middle thirties. Lovely and vivacious, she had been a worker for the Cayuga Democratic Club in 1922 when she had met Crater during an election campaign. She liked him, and later retained him, as Mrs. Crater had done during her divorce. They became involved in a long-time affair. Over the years, Crater visited Connie Marcus several times a week and paid her rent at the Hotel Mayflower on Central Park West. In the daytime, 
Connie Marcus worked as a sales girl at Milgram's and other upscale shops along 57th Street. When news of Crater's disappearance went public, Marcus added to the chaos by disappearing herself. It seemed a logical assumption that Crater and his mistress had run off together and the police investigation stalled. Then, Connie returned to the city alone, explaining that she had left town merely to avoid the publicity. She was questioned closely by investigators, but they became convinced that Marcus knew nothing of the judge's whereabouts. The police also learned that Crater frequented a Broadway nightclub and speakeasy called the Club Abbey. The Abbey was owned by gangland figure Oni Madden and was frequented by mobsters like Jack Legs Diamond, Dutch Schultz, Vincent Mad Dog Cole, and others. A number of murders had occurred on the premises, and it was definitely not the sort of spot that should have been a favorite hangout for a New York Supreme Court justice but this is where Crater went in search of a diversion, although he tried to convince patrons that his name was Joe Crane. However, since so many other politicians frequented this unsavory night spot, false names were a waste of time. At the Abbey, the judge had been especially friendly with a chorus girl named Elaine Dawn. Police questioned her, along with Sally Lou Ritz, who had been at Crater's table for dinner on the night he disappeared, and Marie Miller, his Atlantic City party girl date. None of these lovely ladies were able to offer a clue as to his location. The search for Judge Crater ground to a halt, even though he had been reported in Canada, the Adirondacks, Nova Scotia, Cuba, California, Mexico City, and even Africa. Most assured that the judge had ducked out just one step ahead of someone who was looking for him. A 1947 movie called The Judge Steps Out, starring Alexander Knox, follows the lighthearted exploits of a judge who becomes weary of his responsibilities and leaves his family to become a short order cook. For decades after his disappearance, his name was a slang term for dodging one's responsibilities, and to pull a crater was to slip away permanently. In October, a grand jury convened to look into the disappearance. Mrs. Crater refused to come to New York and participate in the hearings. Nevertheless, the grand jury called 95 witnesses and amassed 975 pages of testimony. After all of that, the conclusion was, the evidence is insufficient to warrant any expression of opinion as to whether Crater is alive or dead, or as to whether he has absented himself voluntarily or is the sufferer from disease and the nature of amnesia or is the victim of crime. In late January 1931, Mrs. Crater finally returned to New York. From the apartment on Fifth Avenue, she announced an amazing discovery. In a bureau drawer, often used by the judge, she found a large manila envelope containing $6,690 in an assortment of denominations, along with three small checks that had been made out to Crater and signed by him. There was also a second envelope, that contained stocks and bonds, and a binder with three insurance policies. A memo in Crater's handwriting listed the names of men who owed him money, along with the amounts owed by each man. The note was signed with the words, I am very wary, Joe. It is believed the misspelled word, wary, W-H-A-R-Y, was likely meant to be weary, W-E-A-R-Y the discovery caused an uproar. Cops had searched the apartment four times and never would have missed the bulky envelopes and the insurance binder. Detective Leo Lowenthal, who had made the first unofficial search, maintained that the envelopes had not been in the drawer in August. Had someone, perhaps Crater himself, placed them there? Had his killers, if he had been murdered, felt compassion for his widow and placed them there in the bureau, or had Mrs. Crater herself brought them back with her from Maine? No one knows, but this was the last dramatic development in the case. The search continued throughout 1931, but no trace of the judge was ever found. There have been many theories put forward to answer the mystery of Judge Crater. Mrs. Crater and many of his close friends believed he was the victim of foul play, Stella Crater stated that he was murdered because, quote, of something sinister connected to politics, unquote, 
and she may have been right given his involvement in bribery, backdoor dealing with Tammany Hall politics, and questionable real estate deals. She also did not believe that the judge would have voluntarily vanished, insisting Joe Crater would not run away from anybody but would meet his problems directly, whatever they were. In 1937, Mrs. Crater sued the three insurance companies for double indemnity on her husband's life insurance policies. During the trial, her attorney, Emile K. Ellis, advanced her murder theory, but left politics out of the mix. He claimed that Judge Crater had been blackmailed by a Broadway showgirl and he had paid her off. When she demanded more money and Crater refused to pay, a gangster friend of the showgirl had killed him, perhaps accidentally. The attorney's theories did not impress the court, and they denied the double indemnity claims. On June 6, 1939, Judge Crater was officially declared dead, but sightings continued for years, as did the theories as to what happened to him. Possible exits of the judge have included his murder by political cronies just before he could testify against them in a graft investigation and a cover-up of his death in the arms of his mistress or prostitute. Some believe he was killed in a dispute over a payoff or that he decided to drop out and start a new life in Quebec, Europe, or the Caribbean. Stella Crater remarried in 1939, but the marriage didn't last. In 1961, she wrote a book entitled The Empty Robe, The Story of the Disappearance of Judge Crater. Although her book concludes that she didn't know her second husband very well at all, she seemed to retain fond memories of him. Either that, or she had an ironic sense of humor. Every year, on August 6th, the anniversary of her husband's disappearance, until her death in 1969, Mrs. Crater visited a Greenwich Village bar and ordered two drinks. After downing one, she would raise the other glass and toast, Good luck, Joe, wherever you are. A possible answer to the fate of good-time Joe Crater came to light in April 2005 when Stella Ferrucci Good died in Belarus, Queens, leaving behind what may be a key to the mystery. While going through Mrs. Ferrucci Good's possessions, her granddaughter, Barbara O'Brien, discovered a metal box that contained a handwritten letter in an envelope marked, Do Not Open Until My Death. In the letter, Mrs. Ferrucci Good claimed that her late husband, Robert Good, told her that a New York City cop named Charles Burns and the cop's brother, a cab driver named Frank Burns, were responsible for Crater's death. Robert Good was a New York City Parks Department supervisor and lifeguard who died in 1975. In her account, Mrs. Ferrucci Good wrote that her husband told her that he learned over drinks with one of the Burns brothers that they, along with several other men, killed the judge and buried him on Coney Island, under the boardwalk at West 8th Street. That location is the current site of the New York Aquarium. According to Mrs. Ferrucci Good's account, her husband told her that when Crater stepped into the cab on West 42nd Street that night, the driver was Frank Burns, a syndicate hitman employed by Jack Legg's Diamond. Diamond was allegedly angry at Crater's refusal to reverse on appeal some lower court decisions that hurt the mob boss. Burns picked Crater up in his cab and then drove a few blocks to where his two accomplices jumped in the vehicle. They drove to Coney Island, where they were joined by two more men. Their intent was to rough Crater up a little and scare him into playing ball with Diamond, but in the judge's struggles to escape the cab, he was accidentally killed. In her letter, Mrs. Ferrucci Good said that Officer Burns was one of the cops guarding notorious Murder, Inc. hitman Abe Kid Twist Rellis when the gangster and mob informant somehow plummeted to his death from a sixth-floor Coney Island hotel window in 1941. Rellis's death came hours before he was to testify against mob boss Albert Anastasia. Rellis became immortalized in New York tabloids as the canary who could sing but couldn't fly. Also, in the box left by Mrs. Ferrucci Good were yellowed newspaper clippings about Crater's disappearance with written notations in the margins. Police sources confirmed that a man named Charles Burns served with the NYPD from 1926 to 1946 and that he spent part of his career 
assigned to the 60th Precinct in Coney Island. Police also confirmed that several skeletal remains were found at the location named by Mrs. Ferrucci Good in 1956, when the foundation for the aquarium was being dug. Decades prior to the advent of DNA technology, the remains could not be identified. They were reburied in pine coffins made by inmates at Rikers Island Prison in an unmarked mass grave in New York City's Potter's Field on Hart Island. Mrs. O'Brien and her family say Mrs. Ferrucci Good never mentioned the crater case to them. They were baffled by the contents of the letter and thought it was a joke, but they turned it over to the police just to be sure. Police were unable to verify or disprove the letter leaving the fate of the missingest man in New York an ongoing mystery. Coming up, in 1986, the Tallmans moved into what they thought was the ideal family home. They couldn't have been more wrong. And Mitchell Kai watched while the police were looking for his missing wife. He even joined in the search himself. No one ever expected that Mitchell was the one who had killed her. These stories are up next when we return to Weird Darkness. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. In 1986, the Tallmans had just bought a house in a new development in Larrabee Street, Horicon, Wisconsin. The family consisted of Alan, a factory foreman, his wife Deborah, their two-year-old daughter Mary Ann, and Deborah's son from a previous relationship, seven-year-old Kenny. Deborah was expecting her third child at the time the family moved into the house. The family were natives of Wisconsin, with plenty of relatives in the area around Horicon. Not long after they moved in, little things began to niggle. The children would frequently fall ill, while Deborah and Alan would fight over trivial things. Sarah, their second daughter, was born in November of 1986. Deborah had become ill during the pregnancy and was ordered to rest, meaning her mother and sister would come over to the house to help out. It soon turned out that neither liked the house and couldn't wait to get out. Deborah's sister actually becoming unwell when she visited. A kitten purchased by the family shared the same feelings toward the house and would go insane, zooming across the living room and climbing up the door. This usually became marked at sunset. Alan shut the cat into the bathroom, but it would howl. One night, after Alan let the cat out of the bathroom, she went bananas again and hung from the plaster of the wall in the living room. She soon went to a new home. And one night, an evening out for Alan and Deborah ended on a jolt when their babysitter claimed she and Kenny witnessed a rocking chair move by itself whilst they played a game in the kitchen, something Kenny also confirmed. When Sarah was seven months old, Alan and Deborah moved her and her older daughter Marianne into a room together, the girls sharing bunk beds. They took over Kenny's old room, he moving into a smaller bedroom. That night, Kenny witnessed a radio alarm clock given to him by his parents behave strangely, the dial moving by itself. His parents, upon hearing this, took the alarm clock away. 
Afterwards, Kenny found it difficult to sleep in his room, complaining of strange noises. All of the children were having difficulty sleeping by mid-1987. They would always waken when their parents went to bed and refused to sleep for a long time. Marianne had apparently gained an imaginary friend whom she would often talk to, which soon turned to nightmares, scaring her. Things were sporadic at this point. Peace would descend for a week before another of interrupted sleep due to their children's problems and Deborah and Alan fighting. Alan later attributed his behavior to the house. Deborah also began noticing things around the house such as the garage door opening by itself, and she began to suffer nightmares, which she was never prone to previously. The dreams seriously frightened her. Alan had a strange experience of his own one day whilst painting in the basement. He had left his paintbrush lying across the paint tray while he went for lunch. When he came back, he found the paintbrush upside down in the paint pot. No one else had gone down to the basement while he was gone. After he cleaned the paintbrush and carried on with his work, he thought he glimpsed a shadow flit across the basement. After that, he called it a day. Another incident in the basement saw the window mysteriously being moved and left on the floor. No valuables had been taken in what appeared to be a break-in, including Alan's expensive hunting rifles. Add to that, anyone coming into the basement would have had to have used a chair to get in and out the window but no furniture was displaced. Deborah became too scared to go down to the basement afterwards. The family bought a dog following this for security. He too acted strangely, though remained with the family, unlike the cat. Significant was the experience Alan's mother had when she looked after the children one night after Alan became ill with a bad sinus infection and had to be taken to the hospital by his wife. The senior, Mrs. Tallman, shot out of the house as quickly as possible on their return. Like Deborah's mother, she didn't like the house much either, and also had a strange experience the night Alan went to the hospital. She later told him that she had been dozing on the living room couch when she looked at the window to find a pair of red eyes staring in at her. They were still there when she blinked. Just before Christmas 1987, Kenny saw the apparition of a small, hideous old woman while he slept in the living room. He woke his mother, and both were awake for the rest of the night. This led to a conversation between Alan and Deborah about what was going on in their house. They concluded that all the strange phenomena had to be a ghost, and they called in their pastor, Rev. Wayne Dobatz. He told the family he believed that they were haunted by the devil which scared them, of course. He asked if any of them had been playing with a Ouija board or held a seance. He also suggested the family may have been cursed. To counter the haunting, Rev. Dobratz asked the Tallmans to attend church regularly every Sunday, which they hadn't been doing up to that point. The Tallmans couldn't quite believe this was the work of the devil, as Deborah didn't think God worked in this way. However, they did as the pastor asked. Dobratz also blessed the house, which kept everything quiet, until a few days before Christmas. The family also played religious music and said prayers at Dobratz's suggestion. Kenny again saw the apparition of the old woman when sleeping in the living room. He'd been sleeping there because he was too afraid to sleep in his own room. By this time, the children were too scared to be alone without their mother and followed her everywhere, including the bathroom. Every night was bedlam as the children were too scared to go to bed. One night, Alan had enough and screamed at whatever it was to leave his kids alone and pick on him instead. Not necessarily a good idea. Soon after, in January 1988, Alan came home from the night shift. He heard a strange wind and voice calling to him from the garage. He saw red eyes staring back at him, similar to what his mother said she had seen. Alan returned to the front door and turned again in response to the voice calling him. What he saw was this. 
He shot into the house, terrified, before quickly realizing the garage was on fire. He went back out to check, but the fire was gone and the garage normal. When he came back in, his lunchbox, which he had been carrying the whole time and had just placed on the floor, shot across the room, apparently of its own accord. Enough was enough, and he went to bed, very scared. He woke up Deborah, and they stayed awake the whole night. Things seemed more focused on Alan. He would sleep on the floor of his daughter's room and try and help them sleep as they were so terrified. One night while doing this, he woke to find a mist rising from the ground. A small apparition with red eyes stared at him, uttering, you're dead. He flew out of the room so terrified that his lips were blue. Deborah thought he was having a heart attack. He was too scared to tell her anything and could only weep. Deborah called Reverend Dobratz to come quickly. By the time he arrived, the family was in chaos. The girls upset at the sight of their dad crying, though they had not seen what had happened. The pastor urged them to leave and stay with family. The Tallmans returned the next night. Their pastor came over, leading them in prayers and communion. He again told them to play religious music continuously. It was a quiet night. Not so the next, however. That night, Alan was on night shift, so his teenage nephew came to stay over. Things began peacefully enough. The children played with their cousin and went to bed. The cousin lay on the floor of the girl's room, reading them stories to help settle them down. However, the same apparition that had visited Alan reappeared to his nephew. Everybody became hysterical. Kenny said to his mother that the apparition was in the girl's room. Deborah threw things into a bag, rounded up the family, and left. They arrived outside Alan's work, and Deborah refused to go back. Shortly after this, the police chief of Horicon got wind of what was happening. Word soon spread about the haunting. The police chief, Doug Glayman, decided to investigate as a haunted house wasn't quite something he expected. He spoke to the family and became convinced of their tale. They stuck rigidly to the details every time he questioned them about it. Glayman also managed to liaise with the press when they became interested with the story and did what he could to protect the Tallmans. The police were also needed to deal with the crowds that descended on Larrabee Street to see the haunting for themselves. This was partly thanks to tales of a snowblower driving by itself and walls dripping blood. Eventually, the Tallmans sold their house and left Horicon. The new family who took over the house haven't experienced anything for themselves. The most in-depth account of the haunting can be found in two books of the Haunted America series by Michael Norman and Beth Scott. It was also featured in the TV show Unsolved Mysteries. Various websites, as well as the Unsolved Mysteries TV show, place the blame for the haunting on the bunk beds used by the girls, whilst other sites claim this is a hoax. Either way, the bunk beds were apparently destroyed. Mitchell Kai seemed like a normal guy. He had a gorgeous wife named Lindsay and a good job as a casino croupier. He had two young children in 1998 at the age of 23. Then the unthinkable happened. Lindsay disappeared from the couple's home in Southport, England on December 16, 1998. She was 21 years old. During the search for Lindsay, Mitchell Kai invited the media into his home. He appeared on news talk shows. The loving husband also called into radio programs. He constantly denied being involved in his wife's disappearance. Kai claimed that Lindsay just up and left one day and never came back. At a police press conference, Kai stated to the public, She left without saying goodbye. I thought she would have come back for the kids, but she obviously does not care about us anymore. Mitchell Kai loved the media attention. Television cameras followed him everywhere. 
The media watched as police searched the couple's house with sensitive equipment, trying to locate her body. Investigators never found Lindsay there. At one point, Mitchell had a documentary filmmaker interview him. The documentarian flat out asked if Mitchell killed his wife. The man responded chillingly, I'm not going to answer that. I'm not going to answer that question because I don't need to. Kai then called the question stupid before the journalist asked the question again. Kai then replied, wait and find out. The public did indeed find out in June of 2000. That's when someone discovered a human torso in a shallow grave near a roller coaster at the Southport Pleasureland Amusement Park in Merseyside. Investigators finally had a lead. They arrested Mitchell for the murder, and then he confessed. In the summer of 2001, he was sentenced to life behind bars for the killing. Prosecutors argued that Kai was a sadistic killer who loved the spotlight. Lindsay's murder was a crime of passion in the heat of the moment, but her husband turned it into a crime of near-constant debauchery with his media obsession. Here is how the murder supposedly happened. The couple got into an argument on December 16, 1998. Lindsay wanted a divorce. Mitchell became angry and strangled his wife. He held her on the floor for 20 minutes. After her death, Kai needed a plan to dispose of the body. He placed Lindsay on the couple's bed and then stuffed towels around the door to hide the smell from the couple's two young children. With the help of his brother Elliot, the pair chopped up her body. Elliot was a butcher, which came in handy for Mitchell's request to dispose of his wife's body. Mitchell and Elliot threw Lindsay's head and hands on a trash pile. Those body parts have never been found. If not for her torso at the shallow grave near the roller coaster, Kai very well could have gotten away with murder. Elliot, the butcher, was sentenced to four years in prison for his role. Mitchell received a much harsher sentence, although he was eligible for parole in 2017. Officials denied his request for parole and sent him back to prison. As for the kids, they grew up away from their father. Robin Wilson, the couple's daughter, released a statement following Mitchell's parole denial in 2017. She said, It makes me feel a lot safer knowing he won't be getting out and it's a little bit of justice for my mom, although nothing that ever happens will be enough justice. There's not much more to say other than we are happy we can relax for a while and not constantly have it at the back of our minds. A member of parliament from Southport summed up the public's feelings about Mitchell Kai succinctly following his parole request and subsequent denial. Parts of the dismemberment body were found near my house. I remember the case vividly, and frankly, I'm surprised that he's even being considered for parole. When Weird Darkness returns, a ghostly spirit brings comfort to a dying man's grandchild. Plus, death comes to us all, but today, Children are shielded from the reality of death, only the stylized version they see in television and film. But years ago, when there was a death, it was a family affair. Everyone of all ages participated in the funeral and grieving process, and some people coped with their grief by being artistic, such as writing a weird song called The Hearse Song. These stories are up next. Winter has Louisville in its grip, and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security, Inc. solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence, and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland a Dallas Powell Mystery by T. Lee Harris, narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com.
When I was about 20 years old, my grandpa became very sick. He had a lung disease and it was taking its toll very quickly. He was at home when suddenly he passed out. His breathing was raspy and short, so my grandma called an ambulance. He was taken to the closest hospital only to be sent to a hospital in Atlanta, Georgia called Erlanger. They said that his lungs were filling with fluid and they were going to put in a tube to try and drain it, but that essentially he would not be making it much longer. Two days go by, still no improvement. As soon as I got the call, I booked it to Atlanta to be with him and my family. My grandpa and I have always been super close. He'd always understood me and been there for me in ways that most people could only wish for. Nothing was keeping me from being there now for him. After about a three-hour drive, I finally made it, but they were already telling us that there was no real hope and to call anybody who wanted to say goodbye. I sat with my grandpa for hours, talking to him like I always did. Even though he was tubed and in a medicated coma, I knew him well enough to know he wouldn't want me to treat him differently, so I told him about my crazy drive there and about some funny customers I had met on my latest shift. I described the beautiful sunset I could see from his window and encouraged him to open his eyes and see for himself, but of course I knew he wouldn't. Mostly, I told him how much I loved him and reminisced about our backyard camping trips, how he always came to my chorus concerts when I was in school and promised him that I would always remember his biggest lesson, never let your fears stop you from chasing your dreams. An announcement came over the intercom saying all visitors had to leave for the night. So I kissed my grandpa on the cheek, hugged my grandma, letting her know that if she needed anything to call me, and that I wasn't leaving Atlanta in case things got worse. After grabbing a quick bite with my mom and brother before they left for home, I drove around looking for a cheap but decent hotel in the area, but there was nothing that I could really afford, so I drove back to the hospital and decided to just sleep in my car in the parking lot. Not exactly the safest or greatest idea I ever had, but I didn't want to leave, saying that I lived so far away and didn't want to be far. I made sure all my doors and windows were locked, curled up under my jacket best I could in the back seat, and just cried. I didn't want to lose him, but I knew there was nothing I could do. Physically and mentally drained, I started to finally drift into a restless sleep when I felt long fingers run through my hair. I sat straight up, but saw no one. The smell of cheap perfume filled my car, and I heard the voice of a woman say, Hush, you will pass peacefully. I will see to it. Sleep. I will watch over you. In that moment, complete peace swept over me, and I drifted back to sleep. An hour or so later, my phone rang. It was my grandma letting me know that he was getting worse and that I needed to call my family and tell them that they were turning all the machines off that morning. I told her I loved her and that I would do that. After everyone arrived, we all stood around his bedside in prayer hoping for a miracle, when I once again smelled the cheap perfume and felt a hand between my shoulder blades. I knew it was the mystery woman from earlier that night because the only thing behind me was his IV pole. I quickly turned my head and momentarily saw a woman that looked to be in her late thirties, in dark gray scrubs with brown, wavy hair smiling at me. As soon as they removed the tubes and turned off the machine, I watched her walk over to my grandpa, laying a single hand on his chest. Within minutes, he was gone, and as soon as the heart monitor screeched, letting us know it was over, she vanished. Personally, I think she's a nurse that used to work there. I never asked anyone because I thought it would be rude, but all in all, it was a strange yet comforting experience. Once upon a time, death was an everyday part of life in America, not just for adults, but for children as well. 
the birth rate was high, but only slightly higher than the number of children who never lived to see adulthood. If a child did make it past their early years, by then he had seen his fair share of death. Unlike today's children, they were surrounded by it. They saw their loved ones die at home, saw corpses laid out in the parlor, and witnessed and likely participated in the butchering of farm animals. Compared to how things used to be, American life now shields children from the harsh realities of death. Children knew what it was like to have death as a next-door neighbor, so to speak. They actively took part in the death rituals of home. Children helped to wash the corpse of the deceased. They sat up with mothers and aunts during wakes. The girls helped to make the food for the dinners that followed the funerals, while the boys helped their fathers and uncles dig the graves. Since women were tasked with the complicated business of mourning, it's not surprising that their daughters were trained to follow in their footsteps. In the same way that little girls were given versions of cooking utensils, pots and pans and cleaning tools, they were also taught about death rituals. By the 1870s, death kits were available for dolls, complete with coffins and mourning clothes, as a means of training girls for participating in, even guiding, death traditions and the grief that accompanied it. Books were published geared towards children that emphasized the duties of families in times of grief. Death was used as a children's entertainment, too. Kids gobbled up picture books like Who Killed Cock Robin that featured lavishly illustrated funeral scenes and recited poems and sang songs about little children who died. Today, we think of simple rhymes and folk songs as something used to soothe and entertain children. They are supposed to put children to sleep or help them have fun. On the surface, these rhymes were supposed to educate and to provide a moral lesson. But if you scratch the surface of just about any old lullaby, you'll find a more complex and much darker history. From the Great Fire of London that is chronicled in London Bridge to the devastation of the plague in the eerie Ring Around the Rosie, many of these simple tunes can trace their roots back to a past that is dark and macabre. And while the meanings of these songs have largely been lost in modern times, there is one childhood song for which the content of the song cannot be mistaken for anything else. Officially, it's known as the hearse song, but a lot of us know it as the worms crawl in when we were younger. It's a favorite folk song of American children, either learned from family members or on playgrounds, and, frankly, it's about the gruesome subject of decomposition. There are reports that the song has its origins in the 19th century when it was sung by British soldiers during the Crimean War, but it certainly dates to at least World War I when it caught on with British and American soldiers. It was first collected in World War I songbooks in the 1920s, but by then it was being hummed, whistled, and sung all over the country. The catchiness of the simple melody and the rare opportunity to speak humorously about the ugly side of death doubtlessly has guaranteed the ballad's survival into the modern era. Like most folk songs, there is no definitive version. When I was growing up, my siblings and I used to sing this song quite a lot, likely to annoy my mother, and there's a good chance that we invented some of our own lyrics to fit the tune. Anyway, this is the way we knew the song, growing up in the 1970s and early 80s. This version is from Rusty Cage and his album Gangstalkers. Don't ever laugh as a hearse goes by For you may be the next to die They wrap you up in bloody sheets To drop you six feet underneath They put you in a pine wood box And cover you up with dirt and rocks It all goes well for about a week And then your coffin begins to leak in the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the worms 
play pinnacle on your snout. They eat your eyes, they eat your nose as you begin to decompose. A slimy beetle with demon's eyes chews through your stomach and out your sides. Your stomach turns to rancid grease and pus pours out like melted cheese. You spread it on a slice of bread and that's what you'll eat when you're dead and the worms crawl out the worms crawl in the worms that crawl in are lean and thin the ones that crawl out are fat and stout your eyes fall in and your hair falls out your brain turns in to maggot pie your liver starts to liquefy and for the living all is well as you sink further into hell and the flames rise up to drag you down into the fire where you will drown your skin melts off as you descend and satan tears you limb from limb your suffering will never end and the worms crawl in the worms crawl out they'll eat your guts and then shit them out A folk singer named Harley Poe added a final chorus to this song that we never knew as children. I'm including it here because I wish we had known it. They invite their friends and their friends too. They all come down to chew on you. And this is what it is to die. I hope you had a nice goodbye. Did you ever think as a hearse goes by that you may be the next to die? And your eyes fall out and your teeth decay. That is the end of a perfect day. Yeah, we were strange kids. Coming up, he was alone at home when firemen were called. The entire house was blazing, except for one room. The room that contained the corpse of J. Temple Thurston. But first, we all know people who love nature and the outdoors. Some will even have their own gardens and even talk to their flowers and plants, thinking it'll help the plants to thrive. But how would you react if you're sure the plants are talking back to you? That story is up next when Weird Darkness returns. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in. But he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com built. My eight-year-old niece Amelia talks to trees. She spends all her free time outside, whispering to the leaves and listening for replies. I used to think it was a silly game, but then something happened that changed my mind. You see, I'm pretty sure the trees 
talk back. Amelia has always loved trees. When she was four, she snuck out of her room one night and fell asleep under an old pine tree in the backyard. Her parents were terrified when they found her missing. When they demanded to know why she had left her bed, Amelia said the tree was lonely and had called to her for company. Another time, a large fire broke out a few miles from her home. Amelia didn't sleep for days and became so exhausted that her mom took her to a pediatrician. When the doctor asked what was wrong, Amelia said that she couldn't sleep because the trees were screaming. Up until this point, I thought Amelia just had an overactive imagination. I thought the trees were her version of imaginary friends, and it was a phase that she would eventually grow out of. But now, I'm not so sure. You see, last weekend, several members of our family got together for a camping trip. We reserved a couple of large campsites to celebrate the upcoming 4th of July holiday. The sites were near a lake, but Amelia wasn't interested. While the rest of the kids played games or splashed in the water, Amelia spent the day introducing herself to the trees. That night, Amelia and I shared a tent. Around midnight, she woke up screaming, "'He's going to fall! He can't hold on much longer!' She began yanking at the tent's zippers, screaming that we had to get out. I tried to calm her, but she would not listen. "'He's falling! He's falling! He's falling!' was all she would say. I was groggy and disoriented, but something in Amelia's tone chilled me. I followed her out of the tent without bothering to grab my shoes or socks. Not even 30 seconds later, one of the trees crashed down and flattened our tent. If we'd been inside, we would have both been killed. Things were pretty chaotic after that, but once we were settled, Amelia grabbed my hand and said the tree was sorry. He didn't want to hurt us, she said. He just couldn't stay up. Could my niece truly talk to trees? I don't know, but if she has another warning, you can be sure I'll listen. The strange story of J. Temple Thurston's mysterious death first came to notice in the literature of the weird in 1932 when the American author Charles Fort presented the matter in his book, Wild Talents. Fort frames the mystery thus, Mr. J. Temple Thurston was, for unclear reasons, alone in his home, Hawley Manor, near Dartford, England. His wife was away, and their servants had been dismissed when firemen were called to the manor at 2.40 a.m. April 7, 1919. The house was blazing, except in the room containing the body of Temple Thurston. Temple Thurston had been burned. At the post-mortem, it was found that he had large red patches on his thighs and lower legs. As if bound to a stake, the man had stood in a fire that had not mounted high. But his clothes showed no trace of fire damage. It was determined later that he had suffered heart failure due to smoke inhalation but it struck authorities as odd that Temple Johnson was found fully dressed at 3 a.m. instead of wearing night clothes. Nothing in the room he was discovered in was on fire, even as the rest of the house blazed an inferno. There were no burned night clothes to suggest Temple Thurston had changed clothes or that he had encountered the fire somehow previous to being fully dressed. It was possible, for all anyone could say, that he had died hours before the fire had started. Firemen were perplexed by the fire as well. Though it raged outside of the room Temple Thurston was found in, there was no clear cause for the fire. No sign of arson, no fireplace or bad wiring, no indication of how the conflagration had begun in the first place. And since Temple Thurston's pockets contained money and his watch, burglary was not the cause of either the fire or Temple Thurston's death. What started the fire? How was Temple Thurston burned separate from his clothes? Why wasn't the room he was in on fire as well? What exactly happened that strange night in Hawley Manor? For those of you who don't know, Charles Fort is extremely famous for his four books on strange topics and is often referenced by modern researchers 
who include Fort's claims in their own articles and books. This is largely because Charles Fort almost always provides a reference to where he himself found his stories, such as in this case. Fort attributes the account above to the Dartford Kent Chronicle for April 7, 1919. So while many other authors also mention this incident, ultimately all of them got it from Fort. Also, a number of these later authors attributed this incident to the topic of spontaneous human combustion, the proposed possibility of a human igniting from inside their bodies and being reduced to ashes for unknown reasons. But Fort never did. Which brings us to a problem because, you see, Charles Fort didn't always list his sources correctly or tell the story exactly as it was reported, and on rarer occasions, Fort would change key details of an account. Fort's altered or incorrect accounts were repeated verbatim by later researchers who took for granted Fort was always right without double-checking his sources. Unfortunately, the story of J. Temple Thurston falls into the rarer category of cheat for Charles Fort because, you see, he reported the victim's name wrong. The person who died in Holly Manor on April 7, 1919 was named John Temple Johnson, not J. Temple Thurston. So any modern presentation of this strange matter that uses the name of J. Temple Thurston for the victim is just taking the whole story from Charles Fort's 1932 book, Wild Talents. It's hard to guess why Fort changed the name of the victim. It may have been purposeful or accidental. In either case, the new name created confusion in later reports between the person who had died at Holly Manor and a well-known British author named E. Temple Thurston, as evidenced by some researchers describing J. Temple Thurston as a writer, which Fort never did. I contacted the Dartford Library by email to see if I could get a copy of the article Fort cited from the Dartford Chronicles for April 7, 1919, and they kindly sent me the actual article, dated for April 11th, not April 7th, by the way, as well as a second article from a differing newspaper in the area, along with some letters on the matters the papers received after the fact. Thank you, Dartford Library. You rock. It was from these articles that, first, the actual name of the victim was determined, and second, all other details Fort chose to share came into question. It's clear now that Fort trimmed the details from the Dartford Chronicle article to make the incident sound possibly paranormal, rather than just mysterious or odd. Holly House, or Holly Manor, built nearly 200 years previous to the fire, had been occupied by the Masters family, and when Mr. John Temple Johnson married one of the Masters family daughters, the two of them took up residence in the hall. At the time of the fire, however, Temple Johnson's wife had left for a trip to the Barbados for her health, and Temple Johnson himself was staying in London while she was away. He returned to Holly Manor each weekend to pay the gardening staff. On the weekend in question, Temple Johnson had told the woman acting as caretaker of the manor that he would be staying until Monday morning, as he had a bad cold. She made his meals for him on Sunday, April 6th, and left around 7.15 p.m. as Temple Johnson was heading to the dining room to get his tea. She left a fire burning in the dining room and the library, and Temple Johnson knew that he would have to turn off the gas in the dining room himself. There was no fire in his bedroom, and the kitchen fire was nearly extinguished, so everything should have been safe. The caretaker only found out about the fire when she returned Monday morning at 7.30 a.m., her regular time of arrival, and she could not account for the fire. The fire had been spotted by several people around the same time. At 2.15 a.m., a hairy waghorn saw the fire from his bedroom window and investigated. Discovering it was the manor house burning, he threw stones at the windows in the front and shouted to see if anyone was inside. Locked gates prevented him from reaching the back of the house, which is where the fire seemed to be mostly concerned. Another neighbor, William Tuching, managed to get a call out to the fire brigade through the factory he worked at. Then Tuching, Waghorn, and other neighbors 
started to help break windows in an attempt to warn anyone inside. They were unable to enter the house, nor willing to risk their lives if there was no sign of an occupant. Frankly, I very much fear that, knowing what I know about fires in general, the neighbors may have helped this one grow by giving it access to more oxygen when they broke all the windows. In any case, around 2.30 to 2.40 a.m., Police Constable Horton saw a reflection of the fire in the direction of Sutton and also called the fire brigade. Horton had been in the area earlier, around 1.45 a.m., and there had been no signs of fire at the time. The fire brigade, after heading in the wrong direction, reached Holly Manor around 2.55 a.m. The fire had grown from somewhere at the back of the house to something that involved the whole center of the main structure. Witnesses initially felt it had started upstairs, as the roof had started to fall in already when they first arrived. Since it was generally known that Mrs. Temple Johnson was abroad and that Mr. Temple Johnson was staying in London, it was assumed that no one was inside the building at the time. Chief Officer H.T. Potter of the Fire Brigade, being told it was possible that the caretaker, an elderly woman, might be inside, began a search of the rooms that he could reach as the rest of the fire brigade concentrated their efforts on portions of the structure that had not yet been consumed. Potter took a winding stair up to a bedroom, but stumbled over a small table, found the next door burning, and had to retreat due to too much smoke. He returned shortly wearing a respirator to continue the search, and in the next room, Potter discovered Temple Johnson, fully dressed and lying on his back with his hands by his sides, his eyes closed, as if he had laid down to sleep. There was a small piece of sponge in his left hand and a flashlight near his right. He was discovered in a small room adjoining to the bedroom, and here only the door was afire. A window in the room had been broken by one of the stones tossed by the neighbors. Reports vary on whether Potter thought Temple Johnson was unconscious or dead at the time. Either way, Potter tried to lift Temple Johnson, but being that he was a very heavy man, the chief got assistance to carry the victim out to the lawn. Potter then informed police of the situation and drove to get a doctor who determined Temple Johnson had been dead for around a half an hour to maybe an hour. The body was transported to a mortuary as Potter stayed behind to help contain the fire. A post-mortem and inquest was held the next day, Tuesday, April 8th. One of the things that was quickly determined was that both some of the initial witnesses and Chief Potter identified the likely starting point of the fire as somewhere around the dining room and library, exactly where the caretaker said she had left house fires burning that Temple Johnson was going to extinguish when he went to bed. Potter also said that to him it appeared that Temple Johnson had been leaving his bedroom when he was overcome by fumes in the adjoining room. He'd been found lying with his feet towards the burning door. Temple Johnson had scorch wounds on his calves and thighs that were undoubtedly caused before death. Though his clothing overall was undamaged, the trousers leg that was closest to the burning door was scorched. In his pockets were found money, a watch and chain, a ration book, blank checks, and other articles. Physical evidence in Temple Johnson's corpse showed he had not ingested alcohol and strongly suggested that he had passed out, then suffered heart failure due to inhalation of smoke and carbon monoxide. Which brings us to the two main points in Charles Fort's argument for a possible paranormal mystery. How did Temple Johnson get burned in an unburned room and clothing, and why was he fully dressed when he died around two in the morning? First off, remember that Temple Johnson was staying overnight, alone in the manor, because he felt sick and didn't want to immediately travel back to London. If he was sick enough, this could have impaired his memory for simple things like turning off the gas fire in the dining room, as well as his ability to properly respond to an emergency situation. A letter to the West Kent Advertiser on April 18th suggested that Temple Johnson may have fallen asleep in his bedroom fully clothed either in the armchair or on the bed, due to not being well. If such is true, he may not have known there was a fire until the bedroom was largely cut off, 
and, taking a flashlight and a damp sponge to act as a respirator, might have initially tried to leave by the main entrance to the room, doubling back towards the adjoining room with the stairway after the sheer heat of the fire scorched his legs. Here, he gave in to the carbon monoxide that he might have been inhaling while asleep and before he knew there was a fire, only to die from its effects after passing out. While this might not be exactly what happened, it should still be very clear that there is no need for paranormal answers to questions in this unfortunate case. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Sinister Caprine Creature was written by Benji and was submitted directly to Weird Darkness. The Most Missingest Man in New York was written by Troy Taylor. The Highgate Vampire, Horror of the Dead, is posted at The Unredacted. Britain's Kindly Killer was written by Oren Gray for the lineup. Sharing Bunk Beds with Evil was written by M.J. Steele. The Girl Who Talks to Trees was written by an unknown author. The Mysterious Death of J. Temple Thurston was posted at Anomaly Info. He Murdered His Wife, Then Pretended to Look for Her was written by William DeLong for All That's Interesting. A Comforting Nurse was posted at Your Ghost Stories. The Hearst Song Story was written by Troy Taylor. The Hearst Song Music Rendition by Rusty Cage is from the album Gangstalkers, and then the Hearst Song Additional Lyrics and Music is by Harley Poe. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Matthew 11, verse 28. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And a final thought, be so busy improving yourself that you don't have time to criticize others. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey, weirdos. You've got a murder, Sheriff. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is Saturday, March 2nd. Who killed her? With wild dogs, boy, this couldn't be done by a human person. We'll be spending two hours with Hexen Arcane, sisters Morgan and Celeste Parker. These sexy sirens, these gorgeous ghouls, will be presenting 1972's Moon of the Wolf, starring David Jansen, Barbara Rush, and Bradford Dillman. What did you find when you examined Ellie? Just that she was murdered. Dogs didn't do it. Like I said. After several locals are viciously murdered, a Louisiana sheriff starts to suspect he might be dealing with a werewolf. He's saying Lou Garou. Come on, how can you go wrong with a werewolf flick, am I right? Werewolf? He's saying werewolf. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun and even get involved in a live chat as we watch the movie. It's Moon of the Wolf on Saturday, March 2nd, hosted by Hexen Arcane. <laughs> The show begins at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, and 7 p.m. Pacific. You can watch a trailer for the film and watch horror hosts and schlocky B-movies anytime, day or night on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. He says that I'm his next victim! Hope to see you March 2nd. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. 
And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.